So many people with migraine are highly impacted, and there are many ways of thinking about the impact of migraine. One way is based on how frequently the attacks occur, and people with migraine can have from less than one headache day per month to attacks on every single day. So the more frequently the headaches come, the greater the impact. But above and beyond frequency, migraine robs people of many aspects of their everyday lives. People lose work. People go to work but find it difficult to function while at work. Family life is often disrupted. Social and leisure activity is often disrupted. And because migraine's a disorder, <coughs> excuse me, because migraine's a disorder that typically begins in adolescence or early adult life, education can be disrupted as well. So part of the reason migraine's a disorder of low socioeconomic status is that it can affect people early in life and disrupt educational and occupational function for many years. There are barriers to effective treatment that operate at multiple levels. To get good care for migraine, it requires, first of all, that a person see a qualified healthcare professional. And currently, only about half of people with migraine, even half of people with chronic migraine, are currently seeking medical care. Once you go to the doctor, getting an accurate diagnosis that you understand is important, and then getting guideline-based treatment based on that diagnosis is also important. So if you look at people with migraine who have unmet medical need, which we define based on a substantial level of headache-related disability, of people with episodic migraine with medical need only a quarter to reverse all three of those barriers and receive appropriate guideline-based treatment. So one of the hallmarks of migraine is that it's both a chronic disorder and an episodic disorder. It's an episodic disorder in the sense that the most prominent aspect of migraine are the attacks where people experience pain and nausea and sensitivity to light and sound. But even between attacks, we can identify differences in the brains of people with migraine outside the context of an attack. So people with migraine sometimes want to think of themselves as having a purely episodic disease. After the attack is over, they may think, well, let's hope against hope that'll be the last attack I ever have, and they don't seek care, and they don't make plans for how to manage their disorder. So one of the barriers ar arises from the episodic nature of migraine and people wanting to deny their symptoms between attacks. So treatment for migraine gets divided into three broad categories. There's non-pharmacologic treatment, there are preventive medications that people take whether or not headache is present to keep headache from coming on, and then there are acute treatments where, which are taken at the time of an attack. So on the non-pharmacologic front, learning to identify and avoid headache triggers is important, and it's also important for people to lead relatively stable lives, regular sleep, regular exercise, managing stress. All the things your mother told you you should do actually help stabilize the nervous system in someone with migraine and keep attacks from coming on. On the acute treatment side, it's worth saying that virtually everyone with migraine takes acute treatment. They could be over-the-counter medications like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. They could be prescription drugs. But acute treatment is something that most people use. And we know that when people are under-treated on the acute side, when they have ongoing attacks that are not properly addressed, that can actually lead to disease progression. On the preventive side, right now, in the United States at least, there are only five drugs that are FDA approved for migraine prevention. 
Two of them are drugs for epilepsy. Two of them are beta blockers. And one of them is on a botulinum toxin A, which is approved for chronic migraine, but not for episodic migraine. There are major advances coming in migraine prevention. And we are at the cusp of seeing the first designer drugs for migraine, the first drugs for the preventive treatment of migraine that arose out of an understanding of migraine biology. And that understanding centers on the role of calcitonin gene-related peptide, or CGRP, in the pathophysiology of migraine. So the new generation of drugs are monoclonal antibodies that bind the CGRP molecule itself or bind to its receptor. And those treatments have been shown to have very high levels of efficacy and to have a side effect profile which is not very different than placebo. One of the problems with the currently available oral treatments for migraine prevention is that they produce a lot of side effects. So if we look at tapiramate, which is a drug that was developed for epilepsy, of people with migraine who were started on tapiramate for migraine prevention, about a quarter remain on the drug at six months and only 15% remain on the drug after a year. And if you ask people why they discontinue treatment, some say, well, it didn't work well enough. Others say, I couldn't manage the side effects. I think what everyone means is that the balance between how well it worked and the side effect profile was such that they concluded the drugs were not worth taking. So there's a lot of excitement in the headache field about this new generation of drugs because it's mechanism-based, because the treatments are very effective, and because there is a very clean side effect profile which makes the drugs much easier to use.